Hello, I'm Audrey Tang. I'm very happy to be here virtually to talk about the work I've been doing throughout this year, using virtual reality for civic deliberation. Deliberation, listening to each other deeply, thinking together, and working out something that we can all live with, it's magical. In a high-quality deliberation, participants become immune to propaganda and misinformation, and feel a sense of deep connection long after the event. Unfortunately, the magic of deliberation often happens in a way that excludes people who cannot be there physically. In the past couple of years, we have deployed tools for translation, facilitation, and transcription, so that people can watch deliberations from afar and express their opinions through online channels. However, full face-to-face -face participation remains exclusive and often expensive. What I'd like to share today is my personal experience on bringing some of the magic, not all of them yet, to virtual spaces so people can share the magic of deliberation without necessarily having to be at the same place at the same time. To me, the primary psychological aspect of VR deliberation is a sense of awe. My first personal exposure started this January when the Star Chart VR application came out I touched the Earth from space and meditated on it for a very long time. That day, just happens to be the day before our presidential election, with a lot of social media propaganda and a lot of noise from all sides, but I was not affected at all. I was floating in space, looking at the Earth. It was sublime. Afterwards, I read up on the phenomenon that I went through and brought it to the Night of Ideas in Paris to share this experience with fellow thinkers in the same event. Without exception, everyone who tried it told me that it expands their imagination. This shared experience let us think about global issues in a much more holistic way. The most beautiful thing I've ever seen is the Earth from space. On this little ball is everything you've ever known, all the history, all of your future, all of the beauty of what it means to be human. The word that everyone uses is fragile, and you can't understand that from the ground because it's not really relevant to you. From the ground, it looks like the sky goes up forever, and from space, it looks very small. At the Night of the Ideas, I said that the night reminds us that we are among stars. Again, here in the Night of Democracy, it reminds us that we're not in our own islands, but are in fact sharing the Earth among the stars. My conception of the scale of the reality of the Earth went from being unimaginably large to absolutely finite and in fact small. It goes from infinity to one. I even get goosebumps about this sort of stuff when I talk about it even today. And it was only after my flight that I began to go, I can't be the only one who's had this sort of reaction. And that's when I discovered this term, the overview effect. And the overview effect is not limited to issues at a global scale. There's a lot of literature that shows if we enter deliberations with a sense of wonder through an overview of the globe, of the city, or of the neighborhood, then people become much more pro-social, less selfish, and much more capable to consider alternate positions and listen to each other. We would all benefit if we all had a shared experience of this kind. Virtual reality is very well positioned right now to start being able to give truly immersive experiences that make you feel like you're there. The difference between a flat video and VR is the difference between watching a football game and being in the stadium. It wasn't until I experienced virtual reality that it became clear to me that it's one of the missing pieces in the puzzle of how we get everybody to understand the beauty of space. The overview effect has such a profound impact that once you've seen it, there is no going back. After I went back to Taipei, I worked on improving this sense of wonder, not just watching from afar, but also exploring the ground. Realities, a photorealistic VR platform introduced around April this year, offers exactly that. We start from space, approaching the Earth, and zooms all the way into a building in Berlin. And here we can look at the chairs, explore the space, walk and teleport from place to place. We can even crouch down and look into the fine details with a sense of wonder, knowing that this is not a fantasy land, that this is a place that actually exists on Earth. 
So even though we haven't physically been there, we still feel an emotional connection as we interact with the space and its contents. And many deliberation topics are tied to a specific place like this. For example, an airport or a public construction. If the site is small, maybe we can walk around it with a deliberative tour. But if it is too large or too far in the future, VR may be the only practical way to build a scaffolding of the construction plan. And this gives us a sense of wonder that no blueprints, no PowerPoints can get across. Even children can enter the space and control with their own hands and make changes in a tangible way. It's like playing Minecraft. A simulation engine can take the changes, calculate how it affects traffic and pollution levels and so on, then project them back into the virtual reality space. And the gratification that we feel through real-time simulation makes deliberation much more enjoyable. And this brings us to the second psychological aspect of virtual reality, autonomy. When we start to meet other people through VR, this gives rise to a sense of autonomy. It's a freedom to move across space and also through time. And to take a concrete example, I was visiting Madrid last week for the Collective Intelligence Workshop. But before I visited, I first worked on a robotic workshop uh, with the people in Media Lab Prado back in September. And you can see here Yago and Pablo talking to me. I was in the robotic form two weeks ago. And the magic thing is that because people see me in the robotic body before I appear in the flesh, so to speak, uh, they already form a attunement to what I have to say and uh, I'm linked to what they're doing. Even when I'm physically in Taipei, because uh, the robot has a 360 camera, I can see uh, what people's feelings are, what people's body movements in the auditorium, and I have a sense of autonomy of going through the robot's eyes and meeting people who want to sit down and have a chat uh, with my robot. And so uh, this is very interesting because it gives people relationships that are much more in common of a embodiment uh, of the relationship that we have in the flesh. So when I actually flew to Madrid right afterwards, there is no disconnection. I feel that I am already in tune with the space and people feel that they are already in tune of what I have to offer. In addition to freedom to move across space, with some imagination the sense of autonomy also works through time. For example, during September to October I held a series of lectures with students in Hangzhou and in Kaohsiung. Although I haven't been to either classroom, I asked each class to model their classroom into this virtual reality space called High Fidelity. High Fidelity is a virtual reality space created by the same person uh, who did Second Life. And in High Fidelity, what all our movements can be projected onto this photorealistic model, and all their movements are recorded and can be replayed in the future. What it means is that not only that do I have an intuitive uh, understanding of what the classroom is like and what my uh, students' model are when they sit on those chairs, but also our interactions, all the lectures, can be recorded and replayed in different settings. And so we set up portals. If you walk into a classroom's pillar, then you get into the Kaohsiung classroom. And again, while I haven't been to that place in Kaohsiung, I learned about, a lot about its surroundings, about its history. Um, the students there were working on a project where they uh, motion capture and recorded the local elders and asked them the memory of what the spaces are, what the spaces contained back in their use. And using virtual reality technology, not only can we look at the space, in the sense of knowing how it was 30 years ago when the elders are still young, we can even wear into their avatars and go through the same motions and feel in the first person's view what it is like to walk through the streets 30 years ago. And those personal experience getting out while they're reaching into the space gets us a much deeper form of empathy than ever before. And finally, in addition to awe and autonomy, we can also use VR to build assurance. In virtual reality, because we can freely change acoustics and optics, we can build a safe place for people to listen to each other much more easily. 
For example, we can make it such that the sound does not become quieter over a distance. To take a concrete example, I give a interview with primary school and high school students when I was in Paris back in September, and they asked me why did I choose high fidelity as the place to meet, and I said, "Well, it's very simple. If I had used the hotel Wi-Fi connections、uh, for a video conferencing." It's impossible to video conference to six people at once, and also, it's very difficult in a video conferencing situation to have the attention of everybody. People would check their phones. People would get distracted by what's on the screen, and so on. But in virtual reality, not only there is no such distractions, but I can also transmit my photorealistic model to the students' computers, and vice versa. They also transmitted their models to my computer, and because of this, we can make the full use of bandwidth by transmitting only the sound, the tones, and where we're looking at and where our hands are. And these are very simple numbers to transmit to, so all the bandwidth can be dedicated to the subtleties of the acoustics. And also because the kids are modeled in a way that is the same height as me. Afterwards, they say they don't feel me as somebody that they have to look up to. Rather, I'm like their peers that they can talk to freely on a much more equal footing. And again, this is impossible to do in the flesh. So I think in virtual reality, we can design it in such a way that makes it much more friendly for people of all sizes, people of all. Languages, people of all cultures, to interact in a way that does not give tension or pressure to each other, but rather can listen to each other much more easily. And now, as a final example that kind of brought everything that I have explored this year together, was an interview that I gave with the next TV channel that's on air today. And in this interview, both the anchor Chen Yaling and I. Where our photorealistic models, we started from the sky, we descended, we walk about, and we had long, deep conversations, and finally gave each other a hug. And when I was giving her the hug, I knew that I had her complete attention, and she had mine. And this is the kind of environment where I feel that the magic finally clicks, and that my brain has registered this as real. Now, in the environment, we can bring up any web pages. Any interactive model that we want to talk about in this environment, we can always revisit in the future and take a different perspective, being from her perspective or from mine. But more importantly, this is the space where hugs and dances are possible, but violence is impossible. And in this kind of atmosphere, in this kind of space, we knew that we have each other's attention. And we make full use of each other's attention. This is the kind of space that I would call a deliberative space. So to quickly recap, we shared about awe, about a sense of wonder, among stars and on the ground. We shared the idea of autonomy across space, as in Madrid through a robot, and in time. And we talk about how virtual reality has built a safe space that makes children as well as adults talk on the same ground and can hug each other without being afraid of damaging each other. So to conclude my talk, I would like to share a prayer that I had when I visit New Zealand after giving a virtual reality deliberation workshop. It goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. And when we see user experience. Let's make it about human experience. And when we hear that a singularity is near, let us remember the plurality is here.